Okay, guys, welcome back. Um, today's going to be a fun day. I think we've got. Uh, give myself a little more slack on that. Um, some of you have seen uh, sort of the CS side of this before, the dynamic programming side of this before. Um, but even for those of you that, that have, I, I hope that you'll see it um, through the lens of dynamics today. And for those of you that haven't thought about sort of um, optimal control in terms of dynamic programming, then uh, what we're going to see today is, is some very simple um, to understand methods that are actually going to do beautiful things to the dynamical systems we were talking about last time. So I hope that by the end you'll feel like this, that you can write down very simple algorithms that really understand the dynamical systems that we were talking about and understand the nonlinear dynamics. Okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me put the, plug this hole in the floor. Otherwise I will, okay. Um, <clears throat> let me just start by reminding you where we were last time, right? We were talking about um, the eyeball of the simple pendulum, right? So. Um, we had this simple pendulum system, and we drew the phase portrait of that system as theta versus theta dot. We talked about the stable, at least in the sense of Lyapunov, uh, fixed point at the origin, the unstable fixed points at the upright, and for the undamped pendulum, right, when when if the equations were just ml squared theta double dot plus mgl sine theta equals tau, right? So I'll have a, a torque here. Um, for the undamped pendulum, the orbits of the pendulum had this eyeball look to them. There's a, actually an a important sort of magical orbit that goes through, that visits the unstable equilibrium. It's called the homoclinic orbit. We'll talk more about that later, but there was other sort of simpler orbits inside the eyeball and more complicated orbits outside, right? Okay, and we talked about plotting this whole vector field. At any given point, I could draw sort of the... Um, the instantaneous, the, the, the tangent of that orbit, really, as, as a vector, by just plotting the differential equation as a vector-valued function. Okay, and then we talked about the thing I wanted to try to get across at the end was that um, control for a second-order system, uh, let me put my colors to use here, my torque input can change that vector. Right? And we're talking about, um, as a control engineer, you get to be sort of a, a puppeteer that, that, uh, that gets to move that vector field around, make it, you know, within limits, the, the, the torque, you know, this would be um, positive torque, maybe this would be a negative torque here, or I should say torque greater than zero, torque less than zero down here, right? But by pushing and pulling on the torques, you get to change the way those vectors um, look, and then you get to change the, the dynamics of your, of your system you're trying to control. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, you know, right now we've got a system that's stable at the downright configuration and unstable at the upright configuration. Let's see if we can come up with a good way of making it stable at the upright configuration. But to make it interesting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that you've got some torque limits. Okay? So how are we going to, the challenge here is, how can we stabilize the unstable fixed points? And I'd like them to be sort of very stable. I don't want them to just be, you know, stable if I start very close to them. I'd like them to have a big region of attraction, right? Okay, so 
if you get to, to move all the vector fields around, then you might think, okay, well, my goal then is to, uh, you know, if I, if I have my phase portrait here, I've got my unstable fixed point, what I should do is somehow change all of the vectors so they're pointing right at the, at that fixed point. If I can move all the vectors around, if I've got this, you know, power over the vectors, then I should just be able to make that a big sucking sound and, and, uh, and bring all the orbits directly to that um, fixed point, right? If you've got sort of arbitrary control, then, then that would maybe be what you'd like to do. But guess what? You're not going to be able to do that. Um, Partly because you're only allowed to control the acceleration, and really you're only allowed to to move. Control only affects the y component of the velocity of the vectors. Okay, and uh, if we have torque limits, then you'll you'll have other reasons why you can't do that. Okay. All right. So, for instance, if I, I you know there's some vector of the passive system right right here, and if I I can just I can only add or subtract to that in the y direction. There's nothing I can do that make it point directly towards the fixed point. Does that make sense? And that's just, it's kind of funny to think of that in the plot, but that just, that, I mean, what that is saying is that I can't, I can't move from here to here without having some velocity in between. I mean, it's just, that's just a, a function of it being a second order system. That's a very natural physical thing. Okay, so, so we have to do something more clever than that. Um, so here's an idea, right, would be, which we've already talked about, maybe we could do feedback cancellation, right? Right, so what if I did um, torque equals 2 MGL sine theta? Right, so that's a control system that would be a, where the, the control input, the torque, is a function of the angle of the current measured angle of the, the state of the, of the pendulum. It's a, it's a feedback controller. And it's an interesting one. If I pop it into the equation, then what I end up with, if I substitute tau in here and simplify, what I'll end up with is a new dynamical system, which is just negative MGL sine theta, which is exactly like I inverted gravity. My g turned to a negative g. Right, so I inverted gravity with this. That will absolutely work. Um, if you draw the face portrait of that, you could go through the exercise, but you'll get just the eyeball moved over. You'll have a new dynamical system which goes like this. You know, and it just acts like the pendulum's upside down, right? Um, if I have a little damping too, it'll slow down, right? This is the undamped one. The problem is that's potentially going to require ridiculous amounts of torque to somehow s to cancel out gravity and act like I'm not only that I'm going to go up here, but I'm actually going to go up as as fast as if I was falling down on the other side, right? So um, it's going to require too much. If I have a torque limit, I, I I'm not going to necessarily be able to do that. So for instance, um, I can just say, what if tau uh, has got to be less than or equal to MGL over 4? That, that would be sufficient to break that. You know, somehow MGL is the, is the torque required to hold myself here. Let me just take a fraction of that. And suddenly, I can't invert gravity anymore, right? Okay, so we're going to be able to solve this beautifully by the end of the day. Um, but it's actually surprisingly hard. It's actually, I mean, it's really difficult to, to, um, to think about how you should redirect these, these vectors and, and reshape that vector field, satisfying all these constraints and, and moving this into a new dynamical system that's, that's stable at the upright. It's really a subtle, hard problem, okay? And we're going to ultimately rely on the computer to do the work for us. Okay, so let's, let's start that story. Um,
Okay, so the big idea for today is that we're gonna we're gonna start talking in a language that we can turn into a program by describing our goals for the control system as an as an optimization as an objective, right? So <clears throat> the big idea. is I'm going to formulate con the feedback control design problem. As an optimization problem. If I can write it down as an optimization, optimization is a great thing. We'll, we'll talk a lot about it in various contexts in, in, the, um, in the semester. Um, optimization is going to give me a very compact way to describe my, my goals for the system. Um, it's going to be something that I'm going to be able to work with on paper. For some, for some systems, I'll be able to just solve optimization problems in closed form for some, for some systems. But, but maybe the, the point today is that optimization is going to be a very specific specification we're going to be able to give an algorithm and ask it to solve for us. Okay. Uh, <coughs> So, so how do I d formulate the feedback control design as an optimization? Okay, so um, somehow I need to associate value or scores with my, I need to somehow label an ob objective. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to say given some trajectory of the system, so this is my shorthand for trajectory, so Let's say you know for all t in some some interval uh, x of t, okay. And this interval um, we'll see can be finite or infinite. But I'll put a star there. We're going to come back to what that means in a second, okay. But I want some trajectory. You let the system run, and then when I'm when you're done. Uh, with that trajectory running, uh, I need to be able to give you a score, right? I need to be able to assign a score to that trajectory, right? So, um, you know, just like the judges at the Olympics, right? So, you know, if the if the pendulum does something, I, I need to be able to put up a 9.7, right? You know, my little guy holding up a sign, yeah? So, you know, uh, every time the pendulum does something, I need to say, Good job. Here's your numerical value, and um, and and that gives me something to something tangible then to uh, to uh, to optimize, right? Optimization can also um, list you know take as 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 a constraint that I'm only going to worry about some trajectories I'm going to that have some constraints satisfied. So I could formulate something that I'm going to give you a score, and I'm going to tell you that, for instance, um, this was a constraint we've already seen that that tau has to be less than some tau max. Okay, so you could write down an optimization saying maximize your score subject to the constraint that tau is less than tau max always. You can also put down maybe more complicated constraints in some sense. You could say at time at x let's say x equals five. Uh, You know, figure out what you need to figure out optimization, but at time equals five or the, some final time, I'd like X to be at the goal. You know, I can put in, I can list different types of constraints and we'll see what kind of constraints um, we'll be able to do. Okay, and then this notion of infinite, uh, what, how would you score an infinite trajectory? Um, you know, we'll we'll see more of this in a little bit. Why that, how that makes sense. But typically, um, you know, the infinite means uh, I need to be able to still assign a score in a reasonable way. So that's going to. I want my score, for instance, to be finite, even if the trajectory is infinite. Um, and it typically re requires um, the system converging to some to, to some solution. So if it's moving around forever, maybe that's a hard case. But um, what I care about is that the score is finite even if the trajectory is infinite. And uh, often 
that implies that there's some convergence. That x and u go to some constant value, you know, uh, to some fixed point, for instance. And then it's easy to talk about an infinite so right, so solution. And we'll, we'll get into that as we see the ex exact formulations. Okay, does that make sense? The idea of just sort of giving a, giving a score for, for a performance of a robot, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then once you have this sort of formulation of, of giving a score, then the goal uh, of the optimization in general is to find a control policy. which in general is a feedback controller. You see my uh, reinforcement learning background with when I use pi for my controller, Scott. And uh, 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 so in general, we've got some feedback controller that, satis that minimizes or maximizes my score. It's actually kind of funny, right? So. Um, there's two communities that work on these sort of optimization problems. There's the computer science community. You'd see it in, as a subset of machine learning. There's people that do reinforcement learning, okay? Reinforcement learning, in reinforcement learning, you give reward for your robot doing a nice thing, and you try to maximize your reward. If you're a control theorist, you penalize the system for doing something, and you minimize the score. So it's, I don't know, is the glass half full, is the glass half empty, but uh, the control theorists uh, penalize and the, the, the computer scientists reward. Um, so, but I'll, I'll be a control theorist today. So let's say I'm gonna minimize my score, um, okay, and uh, plus I have to satisfy my, all my constraints. All right, sometimes we'll be able to do this analytically, but more often than not, and even for that darn simple pendulum, uh, we're gonna have to do it computationally, okay? All right, but let's do one where we can do it analytically so that we can think a little bit more deeply about the way these solutions um, come about, okay? So um, <clears throat> here's, here's one of the the classic examples. Um, we'll do the minimum time problem. For the double integrator. Okay, so the system that we're going to think about here is U double dot equals U. It's a double integrator. Okay. And I'm going to make it a little more interesting by putting in some input limits. Okay. So many of you, um, just from taking a signals and systems course or something like that, will have um, intuition about that system. Um, if you want physical intuition, I always like physical intuition then um, you could think of it as a, as a unit mass um, moving on ice, I guess, uh, with being pushed around by some input u. So this would be the position q, and it's just being shoved around. So you could call it a brick on ice or something. Unit mass brick on ice. It's just a double integrator, okay? But the, the, the input is like having a force on, the, on this brick, and, uh, and the output is the, the position of the brick. Okay, so let's say the goal is to get to zero, get to the origin, as fast as possible. We'd like to get in minimum time to the origin. Subject to the constraint that I'm only allowed to put force up to one or negative one between one and negative one. What do you think the best possible thing to do would be? U equals one. U equals one, okay. So the answer is, your intuition's right, but it's a slightly more complicated than that. Because what if I'm over here, for instance, right? Or what if I'm here and I'm going pretty fast already, right? But absolutely, 
there's something, uh, you know, if, if there's no penalty for using a lot of force, you should use all the force at your disposal, right? So, um, so almost always the solution for this, the optimal solution to do is to be pushing or pulling as hard as possible, right? And, it, and actually, that's a, that's, a that's a standard result in optimal control, is that if you don't have penalties on your input, you're often a bang-bang control solution is optimal. You might hear the, the, the idea that bang-bang is optimal. But it's going to be called bang-bang control. Right, so the idea would be accelerate as fast as I possibly can towards the origin until just the right time. And I'm going to slam on the brakes and I'm going to skid right to, to a stop, right on the right on the goal. Right, that's the be if I want to get there as fast as possible, I can't do better than that. Fast as I possibly can go, hit the brakes. Right, okay. So that that's sort of beautiful that that a potentially relatively complicated policy. We'll see what we'll we'll draw it out and see what it looks like. Um, could come out of such a simple specification, which is just get to the goal as fast as possible. Okay, so let's solve that policy and make sure we understand it because it's it's one of the few times you'll be able to do it. All right, so let's let's just think about what happens. What's the, you know the the differential equation here? What happens if I am? I, I guess the, the we'll start from the end. So let's let's see what happens if I slam on the brakes. Right? Let's think about how we how we decelerate. So. Um, for the case where, uh, where q double dot equals u here and uh, u equals negative 1, that would be maybe my slam on the brakes dynamics, right? Then, well, I can solve that. I'm not afraid of that differential equation, right? So um, it's going to just be whatever my initial velocity was minus time, right? I can differentiate this one. Right, and then uh, Q of T is going to be Q at time zero, my initial position, plus T times my initial velocity, minus one half, A T squared, right? T squared, A is one. Okay, and if you want to, you can actually, uh, you could solve this, you could get rid of time just to sort of picture it graphically how it's going to look on the phase diagram, right? If I were to set, solve this first equation for time and see that it's um, q dot zero minus q um, dot t, and I were to stick time into this equation, then what you'll see is you'll get, you'll get a function here which is squared in q dot, right? I'm sticking in q dot here into t. I get something that's sort of squared in q dot and then uh, linear only in Q. So I get something that looks kind of like this, okay, with the A and B to be solved. Not, it's trivial to do that, but that's not the point, okay. So what's that going to look like? I, I'm, that means if I were to be on my phase diagram here, and I have draw Q and Q dot, if I start at some position and I slam on the brakes, if I have some position and some velocity, I'm going to go through some curve, the exact time you could, you could, we actually have a closed form solution for, but if I just want to plot it on this phase portrait, I'm going to go through some curve, which is this parabola, right? A, a, it's a quadratic thing here in Q dot as a function of Q. Does that make sense? So this, this is a quadratic you know, thing, so it's going to be, I'm going to go through some curve like this. That would have landed on the origin if I was a better artist. Yeah. And if I started over here and I slam on the brakes, then I'll, I'll be on an, another curve like this. And there's some sort of constant curve that I'll be on depending where I start if I just slam on the brakes, right? It's just one half AT squared basically in action here, right? So I start with some velocity, I slow down, I slow down, I slow down, I, I get to the, uh, to the origin, so my velocity is zero, and then I'm still pushing. If I, if I still got negative one, I'll actually start accelerating backwards, right? And it just happens that for this particular system, it's a squared, and so those are going to look like parabolas. I feel like not everybody loves that I, the way that came out, but hopefully that's, you can agree with the algebra. 
Okay, so that's what happens if I slam on the brakes. Um, what happens if I accelerate like crazy, right? Well, it's got to be exactly the, the mirror, right? The equations are the same. So if I, um, if I have q double dot equals u and u equals positive 1, then I'll get exactly the same type of solution. I'll get q of t is q of 0 plus q dot of 0 times t, now plus 1 half t squared. And I'll get on my face portrait curves that go like this, right? I'll start off, I start off with a negative velocity, I'll slow down, slow down, hit the zero, and then accelerate, All right, going this direction. Okay, and depending on my initial conditions, you know, depending on when I start hitting the brakes, if I'm just moving along at a constant speed, let's say, so if I'm, what if I'm driving along at a constant speed, I'm just moving along like this, I hit the brakes, then I'm going to, and you know, if I go, if I, if I keep pushing backwards, I'll, I'll start accelerating the other way, and same thing, if I'm going along this way, I suddenly hit the, hit the accelerator here, I'll go that way. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So the question then is, what's the optimal thing to do, given we know that, I mean, really any of these things in between those are also possible. So, so I could be at any time going, um, right, there's a curve. This way and a curve this way. And given this, get, being at this state, I can choose sort of to, pick anything in that, in that span, right? So what's the best thing to do? Well, the best thing to do is, well, let's think about end game here. We'd like to have it so that at the end of time, I'm going to skid park right into the origin, right? So there's a particular um, orbit that makes a lot of sense for that, and that's the one that happens to be on this parabola that goes right to the origin. Right? So if I find myself, if I just happen to find myself on this curve here, where I'm moving at such a, at a current velocity, I hit the brakes, I decelerate just at the right rate, I end up at the origin. Right? That's a special curve where if u equals negative 1, I'll land right there. And there's another special curve over here, which is the curve where I'm moving along at some velocity, and if I were to just now hit u equals positive 1, wow, I think that was um, because of the calibration of the pen and not that I'm that incapable. Yeah, look at that. Okay, then in this one I'll be moving like that right to the origin. Okay, so those solutions are sort of clear. That's the end game. If I happen to find myself on one of those states, on one of those, uh, you know, on a state along those orbits, then I know exactly what to do. I have a controller, a constant control that will get me right there. The question is, what do I do everywhere else? What do I do if I'm over here? So in this case, if you think about it, I've, I'm past the origin and I'm moving this way, right? So I definitely need to start decelerating, right? What's that going to look like on the curve, and when do I stop? Yeah? Just decelerate until the exact time that you intersect the red curve, and then accelerate. Exactly right. So I can just hit the brakes as hard as I can. I'll stop. Now it makes sense. I've got, I'm way over there, so I should, I should accelerate back towards the goal as fast as I can. That's the same curve here. Until the moment where I'm at the place where I should start breaking again, right? So that's exactly where this, you know, parabola intersects with that line again. So this is going to be u equals negative 1 again. And the same thing is true over here. If I'm moving this way, oops, that was really off. Then I'll go up here 
and I'll, I'll smash into this curve, and I'll go back down. Yeah? Okay, so we're going to be able to show all of this. We're going to be able to show that this is optimal, but, um, but basically everywhere over here, I should be doing u equals negative 1. And everywhere over here, I should be doing u equals positive 1. Okay? That is my optimal policy. And it's, it's actually, you know, it's not hard, but it's, it's subtle. I mean, so, so if I'm going to write a, an algorithm that, that claims to be able to do this, it's got to come out with some non-trivial things, right? We had to integrate the differential equations to get to figure out where that curve was. The boundary between positive u and negative u is this solution to a differential equation put in, right? It's one of the few I can solve, but you know, it's it's not trivial. So um, w w later we can show we'll be able to show when we introduce some of the some more of the machinery of of analytical optimal control, we'll, we'll be able to prove. Um, that this is optimal. Uh, using some of the tools like Pontryagin's minimum principle. But for today I want you to just believe in your gut that that's optimal, because that makes sense physically, right? And I want to convince you that that can emerge beautifully out of a simple algorithm, right? Now, the other thing I want you to think about, what if I were to take this equation here, this q double dot equals u, and I were to replace that with the pendulum equation? Well, what's, what's the right thing to do for the pendulum? Okay, we'll see what the right thing to do is by the end of class, but it's actually pretty subtle. It's pretty subtle. When should I be, you know, even if I have no torque limits, I'm going to be hitting the throttle one way or the other all the time. I'm going to be bang, bang again. But when exactly I should be bang, bang to, to get around and get there, it's, it's tough. It's a complicated function of the differential equation, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I was wondering why is it why is it a parabola on the phase plane? Because mm -hmm. um, I, I understand like it should be like the Q should be a parabola like in time, but like on the phase plane, why would it be a parabola as a function of Q? So it'll be a, par a parabola as a function of t squared. If I just plot over over time, I get a parabola. Yeah. Um, I I think I can even go back. Um, if you were to look at this and just, I, maybe I can convince you just with al algebra, but let's solve these two equations. These, these describe q and q dot over time. And let's see if we can get rid of time just so we can make that plot. So I'll solve q, uh, I'll solve for t in that first equation. And then let's substitute that in. So I get q of t is q0 plus what, q dot I'm, I'm going to shorthand it a little bit. Q, minus q dot times q dot 0 minus 1 half q dot 0 minus q dot squared. Okay, so I get a bunch of terms with, I get some terms here with q dot squared. But I only ever get linear terms in q. So the math sort of tells me that, that I'm going to end up with an equation like this. A and b are, are not hard to solve, but I get something that is a parabola in q dot as a function of q also. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, uh, so in the phase plane plot that you had made for the end game, uh, uh, there's this curve along which uh, u is equal to minus 1 and then you have u is equal to plus 1. When they come and meet at the origin, there's discontinuity in u, right? So, uh, yes. What? This is like crossing the streams in Ghostbusters. Yeah, it's, you know, something bad happens when you go there. So if you if you uh, um, if you go to implement it, bang bang controls are optimal, and nobody ever implements them. 
because they're really, really hard because you get all kinds of things like chattering and the like, right? So, so I would have to somehow detect the, the instant that I'd actually, even, even along any of those curves where I change from, from u uh, plus one to minus one, I'd have to make an instantaneous change. And what happens in practice is um, you'll get the physical system, if you try to implement bang bang control, will go, will follow this trajectory beautifully and then go, you know, and, uh, and you know, get itself shaken silly uh, and your, your motor will burn up. So, um, so people don't really do that and, you, and, and we'll talk about how to not do that. But mathematically it's beautiful, right? <laughs> and, it, and really at the origin there's a special case where you want u to equal zero. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so also, in reality, there will be uncertainty everywhere, right? Yep. So especially around zero, you will never end up exactly at zero, right? So you will want to have something like PID control around that point, right? So is there any natural way of expressing that in, in this kind of framework? It's going to be beautiful. Yeah, way better than PID control. Yeah? You're going to love it. Okay, so uh, we're, we're only going to tease you about it today. But, uh, but if I start turning my objectives and I put an, ex uh, an expected value in my objective, right? If I say, if I don't just reward a particular trajectory, but the expected trajectory or the average cost along a family of trajectories, if it's stochastic, um, then oftentimes we can minimize those uh, objectives and sometimes as easily as the original objectives. And it's going to do exactly all the stuff you think, right? And there's, there's even another way to do it where you, where you try to, instead of having average performance, you, uh, you try to avoid worst case performance, right? And you can formulate that with robust control, and we'll do, we'll do that later in the term too. So, um, okay, good. So now how do we get this subtle thing out of an algorithm, okay? It turns out it's really, really simple, and you're, you know, you're, you're when it's, when it's done, you know, you're just going to think, I, I, I knew that. That was, that was easy, right? So, um, and it comes back to, a, a, you know, a classic algorithm that, that the computer scientists learn early on called dynamic programming, okay? And it really, it starts with the story, is, it starts with graph search, right? So, if you've seen pro dynamic programming before, outside of the robotics context, um, You've probably seen it in the, in the context of graph search. So um, if I have a, some, some simple graph, OK, and maybe I've got a goal in my graph, and I want to be able to find the shortest path from the start to the goal. That's a graph search problem, OK? And dynamic programming is one of the classic um, approaches to solving the shortest path problem. I call it DP often. And you can do it with weighted graphs too. Um, I think I was smart enough to write down some weights that give a non-trivial solution. Let's see. So, yeah. Um, I don't know, if, I have, if it costs me only 2 to go here and 16 to go here, then the path, I think you can probably find the shortest path yourself here, but for the shortest path for the start to the goal, right, I might have to go something like this, right? Okay, so how do you solve that um, uh, if, it's a, if you're given a graph in, in computer science? Well, there's, there's lots of ways. If your graph is extremely big, you might do uh, a, f a forward search with heuristics. Um, if you're trying to, to navigate the roads between here and, and California, uh, you know, then, then maybe you don't want to explore every possible uh, edge on every possible graph. But, but for small graphs and for the types of things we're thinking about in, in this class, uh, in this lecture for sure, um, there's actually, a, there is a right answer, a sort of a best way to do it. And that's to solve backwards from the goal, okay? And the thing you solve backwards is um, the optimal cost.
cost to go or the, the distance of the shortest path. Okay, so we'll call this cost to go J, and the optimal cost to go will be J star. Okay, so let's just get some notation. We'll call, we'll enumerate the states. We'll say that the graph has discrete states um, SI that live in some set S. We'll have discrete actions. AI that live in some set big A, right? So in this one I have action one that takes me to the top, action two that takes me to the bottom, and this will be S1, S2, S3, S4, for instance, right? And then I've got some, it's still a class about dynamics, so I gotta, I'm gonna call my, my edges the dynamics of the graph, right? So my dynamics here, which is gonna be a discrete dynamics, is going to be the S that I end up in as a function of the S I'm in and the action I take. Right? But it's still a dynamical system. Right? And then I want a, a way to encode my, my edge cost here. Right? So I'll have a, a one-step cost which I'm going to call G, which is a function of the state I'm in and the action I take. So the optimal control formulation is that I somehow want to minimize the total cost. All the steps it takes me to get there, for instance, of my path. Right? And if you want to make it a nice infinite horizon or something, you can have a, a zero cost self transition to the goal just to, you don't have to worry about running off the end of the tape or anything like this. Okay, so that's a case where I could, I could write down an infinite horizon um, cost and still have a bounded total cost because I'll, I'll stop accumulating when I get to the goal for, under the optimal policy, right? And the goal is to minimize this long-term cost. Okay, now this is actually um, extremely natural when you're thinking about it as a graph. Uh, it's actually, it actually turns out to be extremely natural when you think about other dynamical systems too to, to separate out this notion of sort of a one-step cost from a total cost. This is the additive cost formulation, basically. So um, that was so if I'm willing to, you know, when I put my scoreboard up at the end of a run, if I'm willing to always make that score the sum of a bunch of little scores that happen at every time, then life's better. Life's easier. And, it, and actually there's a lot of things you could write down in that format, um, right, that you might not even think of. You might, I mean, there's, you could imagine if my goal is to get the, um, the double integrator to the origin, I could just have a, at every time step, I'm going to penalize myself based on how far away for, I am from the origin, right? And if I sum that up, then still the best thing to do is going to be to get to the origin. But you could also write down your minimum time problem, which seems like something where I need to think about the whole trajectory, take the time and measure the time and whatever that's going to be my score. But you can actually write it down as an additive cost too by just at every time step I'm going to get a cost of one. Unless I'm at the origin I get a cost of zero. And you can, so you can make an additive cost formulation of, of a minimum time problem too, right? If I just always penalize myself one until I've achieved my goal. Okay, so that's, a, that's an important idea, this additive cost idea. Okay, so how do we then do, now that I've got my definitions and I'm about to 
lose my definitions by going to the next page, but, uh, but I've got S, A, F, and G. Yeah, that's what came online, and they all make sense, I hope, in the context of that graph. Just remind you that the dynamic programming algorithm then is I'm going to solve backwards from the goal for J. So what does that look like? Um, I bet there's a way to like copy that and bring it to the next page so I don't have to draw it again, but I'll figure that out for next time. Um, all right, so let me just draw it again real quick. It's a good thing I made a simple graph. Okay, so. Okay, so um, J star here is a function of what state it's in. I have discreetly many J stars, the cost to go from each of these states. So I'll just write it as a, again, I'll say the J star I is the optimal cost to go from starting in state SI. And it turns out the most natural way to define that is recursively, right? So I can actually say it um, that J star of I is defined as the minimization over A. It's the best possible thing I can do given I'm in state SI and on the next step I get to be wherever the dynamics take me and then the cost to go. Make sure that lands. Um, I think we can make it land very easily if you think about how this would propagate on the uh, on this graph here, right? So the I can immediately see that from from this state the optimal cost to go. If I if I say that this self transition is zero, so I could stay here forever, my cost to go is going to be zero. J star at the goal equals zero. I can get there for free, so the J star over here also equals zero. Now this one, I can look over all the possible actions. I can either take a 14 and a three. After 14, I, get a, I can get a zero, or I can get a zero. So my cost to go here is J star equals three, right? And my cost to go here is then J star equals five. Thought I'd made it non-trivial, but not really. <laughs> okay, so I can I can just look here. Once I know that I get here, I get, there's a path to the goal that's three. I don't have to to solve this one. I don't have to solve the whole search problem. I can just look for one step. What's the best thing to do that takes the one-term step plus the long-term cost? Right. That's the idea of dynamic programming. You solve backwards from the goal, backwards in time. But you have to solve for everything. Solve your entire graph backwards in the in the goal from the goal, and you can you can find the optimal J star, the optimal cost to go. When you have the optimal cost to go, the great thing is that you also have your controller, right? Your path. So so from here I can I can always write down that the best thing to do, um, given I'm in state SI, is to take that minimizing action. Right, so having the cost to go also basically gives me my optimal controller. Yeah. Sure. That's it. So so great. So this is a recursive equation. So how do I actually solve it? Right. That's a great question. So um, there's a great result. I was literally about to write great result. Um, it turns out that if you use this as an algorithm now, instead of just a definition, if I were to put in a guess for J, if I say J hat is my uh, 
and I turn this into an algorithm, which is like j hat n plus 1, or let me call it m plus 1. If I recursively solve this thing using that equation, Sorry, that's a lot to write, but you don't have to write it. It's in the notes and it's on the screen. It'll be on the video. Okay, so um, it turns out there's this great result which says even if J star starts off uh, as just a random guess, then it'll actually converge to the true J star. Yeah? And it, that's actually true. There's a number of ways you can implement that. You can certainly do it if you do it sort of in batch, meaning you do the entire uh, graph at the same time, implement it and fold it back, implement it and fold it back. It turns out even if you do it sort of a few edges at a time asynchronously, there's results saying that this thing will converge. They're all based on a contraction metric argument that, that basically every time I make one of these updates, I'm going to get um, monotonically closer to the true cost to go. And so it's actually a very robust sort of optimization that will, that will find its way. It's a, it's a nonlinear, it's a, it's a, in some ways a complicated optimization, but it is a contracting one so that, so there's strong results saying that you'll, you can, you can find the optimal cost to go numerically like that. Okay, so this is actually an algorithm. So I started at the end and I worked back, but if I were instead just guess random cost to goes and update them, update them, update them just by looking one step ahead, then that whole thing will converge. And if I do this sort of, um, this guess and just keep iterating until it converges, there's a, there's a, a tweak on the dynamic programming. I mean, it's, it's the same thing, but it's often called value iteration. When I guess this cost to go and I iterate it, iterate it, iterate it, that's called value iteration. Okay, so um, let's see a slightly, just very basic, oh. I know, I love Michael Clear. That was Andy Berry uh, wrote that one day and we've stuck with it. Okay, so um, Here's a, a very simple, let's see. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna make a, little, make a little robot guy that can basically move up, down, left, or right. I'm gonna put a goal in, and I'm gonna ask him to navigate his way to the goal, and don't go on these big red X's, because those are bad, right? So. Um, that's really easy to do if I were to um, just say an obstacle is bad by specifying these obstacles, these big red X's, and say I get a cost, if, I'm, if my state is in the obstacle, I get a, a cost of 10. If my state is anywhere else, I get a, state of, a cost of one. Unless I'm at the goal, I get a cost of zero. That would be a minimum time problem for a very simple grid world robot, right? Which I can certainly solve with, uh, with dynamic programming. So I'm gonna run uh, just the very simple one, <coughs> this value iteration. Okay, so to be relatively big because you'll see arrows and everything. Okay, so here's my goal. It's got a cost of zero. Here's my, um, my bad regions. They've got a cost of, of 10. And I initialize everything else to just have a cost of zero, or, or one maybe, I guess. Right, so this, this is just my cost function is my first step. Okay, so let's take and update every 
by, so every one of these is an, is an edge, do you understand, right? So every, every one of these is a, is, a, is a vertex in my graph, and I have uh, transitions to the neighbors, up, down, left, or right, or I can stand still. That's, my, that's the graph that's embedded on this robot problem, okay? If I do one step of the value iteration algorithm, then I get a, a cost to go, which says it's still zero to be at the goal. It's, I get a less cost, here, cost to go for being one step away from the goal, and the best thing to do is, the vec is an arrow going this way, arrow going this way, arrow going this way, arrow going this way, yeah? And then my obstacles, if I'm stuck in the middle of my obstacle, yeah, you're gonna incur lots of uh, pain, and, uh, and if I'm on the edge, I should at least, in one step, I should at least get out of that box, okay? And then as you run this algorithm, you iterate this algorithm, it will solve more and more backwards from the, from the goal. It'll solve this graph, just like we did on the, the toy graph. Solve the optimal cost to go. And come up with a optimal controller. Now this one, I've, I've clicked the button, what, eight times or something like this. So these, it's still saying do nothing, because as far as it's concerned, there's no path to the goal yet that it's found from there. So it might as well do nothing and just incur cost. Okay, but every time I, I run the algorithm again, there's one more um, sort of level that gets to see the light at the end of the tunnel and, and moves towards the goal, and it'll go through until it converges, yeah? Okay, so, I mean, that's a, that's a really simple example, but it's sort of a, it's really, it, it shows you a lot of the dynamics of the algorithm, right? So, so if I have some initial cost function, then it starts off with the one step cost, and then it sort of follows the dynamics back out to get the, the long term cost. And that's the magic, is that it's actually, by doing this algorithm and, and iterating backwards through the graph, it's actually solving away the long term dynamics of my grid world in this case, okay? Now, there are a couple things to note right here. So, if I'm here, uh, you know, is the optimal cost to go unique? Yes. The cost to go is absolutely unique. Yeah, there's always some, there's only a number that is the minimum, the, of the, the, the lowest cost I could possibly get to get to the goal. Is the optimal controller unique? No. Not necessarily, right? I could have easily gone this way or this way, it would have been, both would have been just as good. Okay, and you're gonna see that in more complicated robot situations, so, so you should understand that. Okay, and then the other thing to understand is, so that was a minimum time problem, but you could easily do some other cost function, which I'm sorry, I forgot to save. What if I instead just said what I, like, if I just said my, my cost is this quadratic cost, so I'd like to be, I get, I'll give you zero points if you're at the goal, zero cost if you're at the goal, and then, you know, as long as you're close to the goal, the closer you are to the goal, the less cost I'll give you. I'll give you a, just a quadratic bowl away from the cost, okay? That's a different uh, objective. It will still reward me for going towards the goal. It might actually, you know, it's, it's got a different properties as, it, as an algorithm and as a, the optimal solution will be different, but you'll see that it's sort of oozes out from the dynamics in the same way. You can watch the way it sort of oozes around the obstacle. Okay, and it'll transform that one step cost into the cost to go, which describes the total cost that I'll obtain as I, as I run this dynamical system. Which in this so far is just a graph. Okay, but it transformed my one step cost into a long term cost. That's the magic of dynamic programming, solving this long-term problem. Okay, so for the double integrator, how are we gonna do that? So that's, it seems like a, a still a far way away from solving a real continuous problem, right? So let me take one step, if I were to just do something that you know, doesn't really work that well, but it gets you thinking about it. So um, let's write the phase diagram of my of my double integrator. 
Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, just the algorithm you're running in yep. the previous grid rule, you're actually looking at every grid point and finding, making a control guess from every point. So what do you mean by searching backwards from the goal point in that particular instance? Good. So, um, so I don't, so I'm still updating all of them at every time. So I'm not explicitly searching back. But I want you to think about it as um, I'm taking a short-term objective and turning it into a long-term objective. If my objective is to get to the goal, then what I'm doing is sort of finding paths to the goal by bringing that cost from, from one step to two steps to three steps to four steps. When, the, when it's a goal-oriented behavior, then you're sort of going back from, you're, that cost iterates back from the goal. It was definitely more true in the minimum time problem. It was exactly that, as opposed to the quadratic one, which already had some cost everywhere. But it still sort of has that, that feeling of, turn, of thinking more and more about the future. Yeah? Same question? Or no? OK. OK, so if I, were to, if I want to so use that algorithm to somehow think about the dynamics of the double integrator, then what do I have to do? I'm going to have to turn this, I'm going to discretize this thing, right? So I'm going to start making um, a graph on top of my phase portrait, OK? Where, you know, this guy, I'm going to have to discretize both the states and the actions, right? He might end up in one of these three states, let's say, depending on you, right? So if um, I'm going to say A1 is, you know, is equivalent to U equals positive 1, and A2 is 0, let's say, right? Okay, that doesn't seem like it's going to be very good. It's not actually all that good, but, but it's the first step, okay? And so if we just do that, then my claim, though, is that if I just do graph search, if I do value iteration on a discretized version of my problem, then I'm at least going to have an algorithm that thinks about the dynamics of that system. I'm going to, going to do this in sort of long-term reasoning about the dynamics. If I put that same minimum cost, minimum time uh, formulation, saying there's a zero cost here, one everywhere else, and I run value iteration, then I should get something that looks like what I want, right? So let's see. Okay, so this is sort of garbage initially. Um, this is the cost to go on the bottom, is Q and Q dot. And this is the optimal control on the way up. Right? Holy cow, it looks just like our math, pretty much. Actually, um, if you look closely, it's wrong. Okay, but, uh, but it's, you know, so like the line's sort of quadratic, but it's, it's in the wrong place. A little bit, um, but but maybe we'll even ask you. We'll see if we ask you on the on a problem set to to, to look at that. But uh, there's discretization errors, which which sort of goes back to the chattering question you asked before. The the dis discretized version is sort of chattering, and and sort of has an effective maximum torque that's or maximum force that's less than the actual one, and so it it, it gets the curve slightly in the wrong place. It is, but my gosh, it comes up with something that solved. This is differential equation, sort of, without, without, it was just a few line algorithm, right? A dynamic programming algorithm. OK, so um, it really says, you know, uh, up here, decelerate as fast as possible, you know. Down here, accelerate as fast as possible. And there's this line where you can just do 0, yeah? Which is not quite right, but that's the numerical, you know. OK, so, uh, and then this is sort of beautiful to look at, too. It can tell you what the cost to go is for, I can make that a lot bigger probably, right? The cost to go uh, is sort of a beautiful function too, right? And it just came right out of dynamic programming, okay? Now, let me fill in a few of the details. I did a little bit more than what I just said to make that, to make that plot. Um, 
So uh, actually, there's a small extension uh, required, which is touches on your question earlier, right? We're going to do a stochastic thing, sort of. Um, let's do this. Let's just think about what it means to do the stochastic shortest path. So the, so the problem I want to address is the fact that um, when I do this decomposition, um, I'd actually have to be pretty lucky if u equals 1 actually landed directly on the next grid cell. And if it, even if it did, it's, you know, if I went a different place in the state, it, that one wouldn't land? I mean, I, I, that doesn't, it just doesn't work that well, right? So it's not that, that nice. In fact, u equals 1 is probably landing somewhere between these two or even between these, these four, okay? So what I'm going to end up doing is instead of thinking about this as a discrete deterministic graph, I'm going to actually think about it as a stochastic graph where when I go here, instead of landing exactly in this state or this state, I'm going to pretend that I land in this state with some probability, in this state with some probability, in this state with some probability, based on how close I am to those points. And that turns out, that's a funny way to think about it because there's nothing stochastic in the problem. That turns out to be exactly equivalent to having a function approximator, a linear function approximator sitting on top of this and thinking about this as a graph. But I, but I think, it, you know, that's the justification, which, I'll, which you'll see more carefully. But the, the intuition is I'm going to just pretend it's, it's, I'm going to do the interpolation between these points by doing it in probability. I'm going to say there's some probability of, of, of landing in, these, in the neighboring points when I don't land there exactly. And, and just trust me that there's, a, there's an exact justification for that in the discrete world. Okay, so the stochastic shortest path would, if, would be if I were to replace my s of n plus 1 equals f of Sn, my dynamics here with a probability distribution, right? Some transition probabilities. I'm going to just shorthand my probability. We'll do it more formally later when we get into the stochastic stuff. But, you know, there's a random variable, capital S, that prime that equals Sn plus 1, but just, there's a probability of landing in this Sn, uh, SN plus 1 given Sn and, and this An, okay? And I'm going to, I can solve with the same dynamic programming algorithm the expected cost to go. Meaning the average cost that I'm going to incur. with just minimizing over A. Again, we'll do it recursively. Uh, G of SI A. Now it's plus the expected value. So again, I want you to see this. And this isn't the most important point right here. If it's too fast, I'm, um, the probability of this. Okay. The point is that it's a minor modification of the algorithm of the, um, I'm sorry, I, I did it in two steps. This gives me my expectation. So <clears throat> almost identical algorithm to what I did before, except I just got a couple of probabilities in there. So I'm going to average over a few possible states afterwards. I can do the same recursive algorithm to update. It'll solve the stochastic shortest path problem. Okay. And again, in 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 the code that will the, in in the Drake code that you'll you, you'll be able to download and play with, um, then those probabilities are done uh, with. I, I I choose the probability with an interpolation method called a barycentric interpolation. The linear, I, I use the linear barycentric interpolation to choose those probabilities. Okay. But it's, it's very simple and it gives you exactly what, uh, what I had before, what I showed you. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I know I did that quick, but I hope that, that sort of the, the intuition is that there was something else we had to do to address the continuous state 
in continuous action really uh, uh, notion. We, we're still going to discretize actions. Okay, we're going to choose each of these, but each of these edges, since they don't land exactly on the right state, I can I can get closer to a continuous state system by interpolating with uh, treating it as a probabilistic graph. Okay, and when I do that, I get out exactly what you saw. Let's see the difference between. Um, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I simulated it too, right? So it goes directly to the goal, and that's the uh, error I was telling you about, right? So it's close, but it's actually depending on how much I discretize, um, it can be off by a bit. Okay, so let's try the, um, the quadratic cost. Is the other sort of um, example that I you're going to see a lot because um, for linear systems, basically those are the ones we can solve. Okay, so now I started off with the quadratic cost. And look at sort of how beautiful this thing is. Now we're going to get a smoother um, control policy so we won't be doing bang bang control. We won't have chattering problems. And this thing just solves away. And actually, I, just so you know, I, I put pauses in here to slow this down so you can see it happen. It's actually, you know, it's just a blink of an eye, right? Okay, but it's thinking about the dynamics, you know? And it's, this one, it's still, I, the reason it's a, a certain color here is because I discretize and I have some torque limits, but it's smooth inside here. And if I were to take away the torque limits, this would still be a well-posed problem and it would be smooth all the way out, okay? In fact, it would be a linear controller. <laughs> and it's done. It should be a, a linear function. Okay, so that's, that's cool. All right, so here's the big question. If it works for this and this algorithm for the double, pen, double integrator, and, uh, and I didn't do anything about, I mean, I just put in an arbitrary dynamics, an arbitrary graph, right? Then it should work for the pendulum, right? It should work for any sort of system where I can reasonably tile the state space with, with a graph, right? So that's not going to work for a humanoid robot, okay? So, uh, uh, spoiler alert, you know, don't try, uh, you know. <laughs> even if you have 10 bins per, per dimension, that's, you know, 10 to the 68 is a big number. You don't want to do that. Um, so, but, uh, but if, you know, for, for low dimensional systems, you can actually really do beautiful stuff. So the LQR response, just the, the quadratic cost, has a slightly different response. It missed the goal by a little bit. It'll come, it'll come back and settle, but at least it's gentle. Okay, so let's do it for the, for the pendulum. All right, so this is, I forget which one, this is obviously the minimum time one, I guess, but let me see, let's see. All right, so first of all, you'll see a couple things here. First, I, the coordinate system wraps, I put the upward configuration at the top, put a cost on. Look at that, I mean, that's awesome, right? So it's just, it just turned like the, the worst place to be is down at the bottom. Yeah, the best place to be is at the top. And, you know, it's a lot better to be here headed up than it is to be even like, you know, with too much velocity, you know, that's worse. And certainly it's this, you know, if I'm, if I'm in this position heading towards the goal, that's a heck of a lot better than being in this position headed away from the goal, right? That's why it's asymmetric this way, right? It just captures all of the beauty of the dynamical system, right? With a little graph search algorithm, right? And it's uh, and it's got really. I mean, you can't solve these away. Um, but this, the, it's got a bang bang solution, just like the the, the uh, double integrator, because there's no penalty on you. But the the surfaces on where you switch are are, are tough functions of the dynamics, um, and they're going to be wrong a little bit because of that chattering um, problem. But it really captures it pretty beautifully, right? And and it's, yeah, it's good. So, so let's, uh, the other thing you might see, actually, if you look at that, is that 
in the vicinity of the fixed point, the new fixed point here, we've made a fixed point, um, it actually looks a lot like the double integrator did, right? So, so up close, it's looking not so different from the linear system, but as you get farther away, the nonlinear terms start coming in and really changing the solution. All right, so let's, um, let's change our cost to, to this other one, which is just a quadratic cost away from, from the goal. And, and I guess I should have said when I, um, when I say LQR, that, that, uh, that's a linear quadratic regulator. That's, um, it's actually a nonlinear problem here. Sorry, that's just a habit. Um, but, uh, but basically, it's a, it's a cost on x squared being away from the goal, and then also on u squared. So I'm putting some penalty on actions. That's, and I can increase my, my limit. Unfortunately, because I'm discretizing, I have to put some fundamental limit on u. That's uh, unavoidable in, in the value duration. And Well, there's cases where you can get around it. But. Okay, so here's the uh, quadratic cost being taken from this simple quadratic function around the goal and pulled through the beauty of the dynamics, right? And you get this, you know, these, I don't know, internal waves of the pendulum or something like this, right? Okay. So optimization is really, and, and the other thing about this is that the, the challenge of writing the controller was only as, I mean, once I have this code, uh, you know, which is not that hard to write, then, uh, then now if I want to have a new dynamical system, all I have to do is write down the equations of motion, tell me where, where I want to discretize it, and you know, where, where I should put those cells, and a cost function, which you write in a line, right? And it'll solve a new dynamical system, right? So this, the, there's, a, there's a real power uh, of using optimization to specify the control. You're, you're able to many times abstra ex abstract away the details of the robot, okay? Um, good, so I said a lot of different things there. Um, I, let me just close by, by making sure I, I get some of the key ideas across, right? So of course, the control as an optimization is the number one sort of message for today, but you know, one of the things that happened there that's important really is, the, is this notion of additive cost. That's what allowed me to think of it as a graph search and thinking about it as a sum of edge costs. That's really a key idea and that's gonna keep even our, our analytical at attempts at, at optimal control much more tractable. Um, then the, you know, this, of course the solution by discretization um, plus dynamic programming is, is important. Um, the value iteration update that I wrote down, the J, um, you know, this, this iteration, uh, J star I equals min over A, you know, this value iteration update, that's, that's important that you should make sure you've if you haven't seen that before, make sure you think a little bit about what, why that's the right thing, what we wrote down was the right thing. And, and even for the stochastic case, the fact that this idea that we can approximate continuous state as um, a discrete stochastic state, a stochastic problem. You know, I, I encourage you to think a little bit more about that and I'll, I'll give you some, some things to think about in the, in the notes and uh, on the problem sets, okay? But this is the, that's our, our first attempt to, um, to move around the vector fields using, using an algorithm, okay? And we're gonna get algorithms that, we're gonna look at where that fails in, in just in terms of scale and other things. And we're gonna get algorithms that do almost that for really complicated robots, okay? Even when we can't mesh the state. Um, but it'll, be, it'll get harder, so. Great, see you next week. <laughs>